Oh, gee, which one did you use? If I uh, messed something up. No problem. No, no, it was, I think I copied it into my calendar, but you probably sent an actualized one. Ah, okay, fine. So, anyway, anyway, we're good. Yeah, cool. Uh, actually, let's try sharing your screen to make sure it actually works. That's the okay. most popular way to, uh, you know. I share a window, I guess, right? Uh, I think so. Let's see. Um, Work. Yes, uh, fantastic. So then let me see. Uh, it's now we're streaming. So let me start the so what will happen is uh, if anybody wants to ask questions on their own, they'll they can join this thing, but most people just buy a, a stream. And if anybody asks questions, I can like ask you directly that way. Um, all right, so then let me see. Um, Let me start the recording one second. It'll ding when it actually uh, starts. And then, yeah, and then we can go. Um, and our question, okay? Yeah. Fantastic. All right, cool. Thank you. So, hi, everybody. Uh, I'd love to introduce Professor Ursula Eicher from Concordia University. Uh, she's an expert in, uh, well, analyzing the dynamics of urban systems and measuring them. Um, so, you know, welcome, Ursula. Thank you, Greg, for having me. Right, so, yeah, go ahead. There's no much of an intro here. Okay, no more introduction. All yeah. right. Okay, so, yeah, okay. Um, well, welcome everybody to my presentation. I will uh, take you a bit through what we do here at Concordia um, in the Next Generation Cities Institute um, in Montreal. We've been building um, analysis and modeling tools for quite a while, and um, but I see whether we can get together, do some work together, maybe, and I share some knowledge that we um, accumulated in my four years here in in Montreal, coming from Germany originally, and I came here with the Canada Excellence Research Chair on Smart, Sustainable and Resilient Cities. And I set up this Cities Institute to bring together basically all the researchers working on urban topics um, at Concordia. It's quite a large um, institute with about 200 faculty, lots of uh, research centers, and we're dealing basically with the, the built and natural environment with a lot of data around um, mobility, but also with community engagement um, strategies. And what I want to show you today, I mean, the, the tools we build for, for cities um, cover basically these, these domains in the city. And I'm going to talk mainly about um, digital tools today, but at the same time, um, we going also into the city. Of course, our own campus is one of the living labs, but we also, um, do some work with uh, this, the the city themselves, the, the private sector, to to then bring these um, zero carbon projects on the ground. Because tools without application uh, don't really create impact. So I think that's that's our main um, mission. And um, my background is in in physics, so I've been involved basically all my active research life um, with um, carbon emission reductions. And of course, Canada and the US are still um, the, the largest emitters um, on a, this is a life, lifestyle carbon emissions and transport and housing are and some services uh, related to, to people's habit around goods, of course, they purchase the, the kind of leisure activities and food make this sort of large carbon footprint and as you know um, we, we're supposed to decarbonize very fast so we need to go from these about 14 tons to two and a half tons in in a very short time until 2030 and and even drastically less emissions um, um, until 2050 so that's basically what drives us to to build these tools and uh, they have, of course, different scales and, and levels to support decision making in, in urban areas. And um, we realize that just crunching numbers, of course, um, doesn't really convince anybody. So um, I'll show you also a bit what we do on, on the visualization side and, and how we try to use these digital tools to also engage 
stakeholders better. So we built a whole tool set and I just throw you right into um, these tool sets um, to, and, and then I explain a bit the, the science behind and, and how we actually deal with, with the data. So the first one you see is a basically a, a web 3D interface for the built environment. We also run um, traffic models. We basically display also all the data we can find on, on the city. And I mean, there's a lot on open data portals of, of many cities. But um, for example, the information about the, the network infrastructure or the biodiversity in a, in a city, it's not all in, a, in one homogeneous data source. So, so we built this tool set where we combine all these data sources to do sort of cross-sector analysis. So to, to model the, the building energy consumption, um, to see where the traffic flows, to, um, to then find out can, where can we put additional um, charging infrastructure and then see is the network, the distribution network actually strong enough in these areas to take up all these additional electrical loads that we will most probably get if we take decarbonization serious. So that's basically one interface to the data, um, um, very accessible, of course. Um, I can share the link with you, citylayers.ca. Um, you can play around with it um, yourself. And then basically we said, well, we need to do something a bit more engaging for, for the users. So we basically take the same 3D data um, of the buildings and we often have this debate of what is actually a good density. I mean, is six stories more livable than 10 stories or 20? Um, there's no real scientific evidence. I mean, it depends a lot on, on the type of um, context and the users. So we basically wanted to build these tools to let the um, citizens or other stakeholders play around with their urban area. This is actually downtown Montreal change things and then actually zoom down to street level and say, well, do I really like um, what is proposed by, by a developer? Um, do I like the situation as it is? So this is basically built with the same kind of data, but now um, the goal is to get interaction um, of the players. So get citizens basically to, to give their opinion on whatever, the green space, the, the type of public space, the traffic, the uh, the height of the buildings. Um, so you you have different means of doing that. Um, the here is just simple comments or taking snapshots and then commenting later on. And we basically want to do that um, to use that to to have people experience experience walking around the city. The city really should work on this problem. <laughs> giving comments yeah, and very and. Scary and basically earning some kind of eco credits to to for us to find out really what attracts people and what what they don't like and and i think the idea is to really move to these kind of virtual town hall meetings where instead of just looking at a plan that a developer presents you can yourself modify things in this sort of god mode and then zoom down and and walk around and see whether you really like it so Let that's me, the second this, because this sounds it this is deceptively simple. This sounds like, oh, this is some city, but this is potentially extremely um detailed because a real urban design is that like you put this plant here, this plant here, or it could yeah. be add one more story to every building, which may be a simple verb. Uh yes. so what maybe what's a set of verbs that people can propose? And are most of these more like for city planners or for regular citizens? I mean, the the original intention came from a from a project that is ongoing here in Montreal, which is basically the, the question was really building height because that's what what is the main controversial point in in zoning debates. So it's, it's a new district, or no, it's an existing district, but uh, it's it's getting rezoned. So um, so that's an urban planning question. But then you have lots of public consultations. And, and then people um, are supposed to give their opinion. I mean, either citizens, but it could be also NGOs or um, other developers. So to, to basically intervene in this um, planning process and say, I like it, I don't like it for this and that reason. Um, and the first, so the first thing we implemented is this height modifications because that's one of the main zoning 
um, decision. But you can, I mean, the, the goal is to, to implement more features that you can change. You can, for example, one, one, one thing citizens really care for is uh, the, the green space. So you can then change a street to a green space or, or a parking lot or whatever. Um, so it is, of course, totally unlimited what you can do. And then the, the goal is to calculate. I, I come back to it in, in the science um, description. The goal is then to come back to it and, and really calculate what does it do to, to carbon footprint, uh, to water management, and, and all these urban heat island and, and everything affected. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, so the, the third tool, and then I go a bit in the background of how we do things and um, what, what is behind it, basically. So the, the third sort of interface we build, and I, I show you with the software architecture behind it, is to say, okay, now we have this more playful mode, but we also need a tool um, that is useful to, to look at a, here in that case, a large building complex, an industrial heritage building, and see what can be done in a, in a more like an engineering way. Um, if you change building materials, if you green the roof, what does it do to heating and cooling and carbon footprint and, and so on? And we sort of, um, in, in my experience as a building engineer, um, these simulation tools exist, of course, but they're usually you need a specialist to, to run them. And the same, so we tried the same thing. We have already this 3D model. We use Unity as a game engine and say, well, why, why can't we make it a bit easier to um, to make these modifications um, and change heat pumps and change building materials and um, windows and whatever and use real databases um, that are available and then see what does it do to heating and cooling um, of, of the building or carbon footprint or costs or what, whatever um, uh, somebody is interested in. So. Um, so I would say that that is sort of in between um, the two tools I, I showed before, um, sort of easy to use, um, but but sort of really for the professionals, a usable tool to calculate your energy, lighting, cooling, heating, and so on, design your energy systems and, and do modifications on the building in a much more intuitive way that if, than if you would use a, a simulation tool like Energy Plus or or transits or what uh, there's tons of them available but you usually need an engineering company pay uh, at least ten thousand dollars to do to get the answers and we think it can be really simplified um, and we want to use it as a building retrofit um, tool for for cities you can run scenarios you can compare costs and performance and make it visually a bit more attractive than your than your usual tools okay so so actually, to understand the difference between this and those, like Energy Plus, um, is it that this requires less data and is less accurate? No, 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 no. It, I mean, it actually has Energy Plus running in the background. Oh, so, so it, it, it uses it's basically just the front end to to parameterize your your building simulation tool. Okay, so then what are the tools that, that are, like, what, what models is this a front end for? So it's okay, uh, let, let me, let me, I. I go through it now with the oh, science. Awesome. So I, I, I show you a bit uh, what it means in terms of, of uh, creating the input data and what the software architecture beyond it is. So what data do you need to model? Of course, the accuracy of a model always depends on, on the available input data. So so this, this is the, the most um, general tool. I mean, here we want real-time interaction. So this there are limits, of course. You you to run a sort of um, dynamic building simulation takes, I mean, in the order of minutes. I mean, especially if you do shading in in the game, we want immediate interaction. So, this is more. This is probably the most aggregate um, model we do. So we rely more on system dynamic models um, to calculate all these sustainability indicators or surrogate models that have been trained on on building simulation tools. Um, the, the purpose is really to to go fast, have real time interaction. But I I go into what we do um, in the um, in the energy stimulation of a building, or of course we are interested on urban scales, so clusters of buildings, uh, sort of hundreds of buildings or thousands of buildings. So um, how do you do that? 
So we have, as I said, we have this uh, interface, just just an interface to to select an area of the city, and then and we have the 3D geometry. So and and we basically try to automate this process of of uh, selecting a building or, or five or ten or or whatever or the entire city, and then modeling um, that building with the surroundings um, for shading mainly, um, and and do these retrofit scenarios. I mean, we basically spent the last few years of automating the process. And if you think of the data that you need, um, of course you need geometry, and that's still an issue. I think that my, my first sort of takeaway would be to say, so there is of course data around, but not that much and not very sort of harmonized data. So there's still a lot of data cleaning and spatial joining and so required to come from um, the geometry over some attributes like the age, the usage, the occupancy, and so on. What kind of energy systems do you have inside? So you need all that information to basically model a building and then come up with some retrofit scenarios or design district energy systems or calculate urban heat islands or air pollution and, and so on. So we do all, all of this and I just start with the, the buildings first, so we want to model the building energy demand, then we want to automatically size an energy system, and we're talking about decarbonization, so it's a lot of work on heat pumps, because that's most probably going to be the energy system of the future in, in cities, because it's electric and you can use renewable electricity to, to run it. So we size the, the heat pumps, and um, for all this, you need to have a lot of um, data and the data needs to be structured. So we spend a lot of time of building these central data models um, where um, a building inherits from the city, the, the location and, and some attributes. Buildings are composed of thermal zones. Thermal zones are composed of vaults that are either facing outside or adjacent zones. There are thermal openings like windows and so on. So there's a lot of detail in, in these um, data models and it needs to be harmonized. Um, and we basically created our own central data model and map all the data that we can find on to this data model so that then all the tools that we build can always are always guaranteed to have the same input data structure. So that's basically the entire software architecture um, handles a lot of different urban data. So geometry, road networks, weather data. Then we have parameter catalogs around um, construction because typically we only know it's an office building from 1950, for example. So we need to have a data catalog of saying an office building from 1950 in Canada will or better in Quebec or better in Montreal, will most likely have this construction. I mean, whatever, a brick layer, few centimeters insulation and some plasters and so on. So, and then we need to have workflows that organize that data into um, or pre process the data and put it in our central data model to then run different energy simulations. And what I showed you, I basically started here on, on the, the interfaces. So we have an API in the middle that then connects to, to the city layers, the Web 3D interface or the Unity game engine or this retrofit tool, or we have some, some other tools that we're building. Um, but the, the basic idea is to separate um, the whole data processing and, and modeling from the, the interfaces. And, and I want to give you just a short glimpse of what it means to, to handle the data because there's now many companies, startups coming up and saying, well, I want to do decarbonization strategies for cities. And can I not sort of simply use urban data to estimate where we are now and where we could go to decarbonize? And so we started to look at, of course, open data and we use this um, the, the best data format um, sort of standardized by the Open Geospatial Consortium with CityGML. It's available in many cities, but not on the entire, um, not for, for every building. So in Montreal, for example, there's only six boroughs which have um, CityGML um, data available. Um, it, it is very detailed, it's sometimes even too detailed for building energy modeling, so you, you, then you need to spend some time to, um, to 
basically simplify the geometry again. Otherwise, you have so many polygons that your energy plus model um, will not be able to handle it. So, so that's this kind of data set. It's not complete. What most cities do have is um, um, this flight over information lidar data sets to to look at building heights, and that includes um, roof surfaces and um, available. And then you have other data sets from Microsoft or here from Natural Resources Canada, they're actually available um, Canada wide um, level of detail one, which means basically just extruded footprints. So no roof shapes, which is okay if it's not a single family sort of residential area, distilled roofs, then you make some errors in energy calculations. But if it's a sort of reasonable density, it's actually okay to do without the detailed roof shapes. The problem is none of these data sets are perfect. So in Montreal, we had some strangely erratic uh, data where all of a sudden the building height was completely wrong, as you can see here. So in incorrect building height. The other thing, um, because the, um, they took the height most probably from LiDAR flights, um, and no, it's, I don't know why it comes here. Um, the other problem was that um, many um, data sets actually have only considered this whole green thing as, as one single building. Um, so no split according to, to footprints, to parcels. So again, if you want to have a, a building by building simulation and the proposition of a retrofit scenario, you need to then do some spatial joining of these different data sets of say, okay, let's overlay that green um, and I can data with um, the property assessment um, data to split it again into, into land parcels. And then again, uh, look for other data sets to then add information like year of construction or usage. So here we had only one single height. That's the other problem because it had only, it just considered it as one building. So once you uh, do the um, splitting of, of the um, geometry into individual buildings, then you can attribute the individual heights coming from the LiDAR data set. Um, and then, as I said, you you can add other attributes and we've spent quite some time of um, figuring out what are the minimum kind of attributes you, you really need for energy simulation. And I would say that the absolute minimum, of course, apart from the geometry is um, the year of construction and the usage of a building. So what, what is called category here. So is it residential, uh, office, mixed use, commercial, and so on. Of course, we would like to have more information and that's maybe where, where you guys um, could help. I mean, we would like to have window to wall ratios. So we, we do some image analysis, of course, to extract um, uh, window surface areas, but um, we would like to know what kind of energy system is inside the building. We usually don't have that information. There's a lot of work going on on schedules. So again, the best if you have real-time data on occupancy of schedules, your energy models are getting better. Um, how much do you need to zone inside the building? Can you model an entire building as just one big individual zone or do you need to sub-zone Lots of open questions. And, and then finally, if you go to retrofit scenarios, um, you can imagine that for every building, you have hundreds of options of, of changing one thing at a time or changing windows and roofs or changing the HVAC and, and so on. So we started to work on surrogate modeling to, um, to run all these energy simulations once and then um, have them available for faster urban scale simulation. So I would say, I mean, to conclude that, part of the, the presentation, I mean, to, to really model the, the carbon footprint um, of a city, you, you need a lot of data and the data is not yet very harmonized. So it's, it's um, lots of work to be done. But once you've done it, and we've now done it for, for Montreal, then you can really start um, answering questions of saying, here we've got a neighborhood, this is in the plateau in, um, in Montreal, and this is basically downtown core. And so the question is often urban planners ask you, especially if they densify or build new, uh, is that a good form? How is it, which urban form is actually better for heating and cooling? Let's say we have the same insulation standard 
same kind of materials, is one better than the other? And does it make a difference whether it's a form like this or whether all these buildings are basically separate, like you would have in a more residential setting? And basically, the short answer is yes. If you look at, at heating demand here in, in the, the real scenario, the here in Montreal, cold climate, um, no retrofit, we consume about 180 kilowatt hour per square meter. If you have exactly the same standard, but you put the buildings apart, so you have much more heat loss, of course, you basically double your, your heating demand just by that. And if you look at the figures for heating um, in the downtown core, instead of um, nearly 300, we go down to 200 because the downtown core is denser. So the more dense, the better your, your energy consumption. So it does make a difference and you can really quantify now what that means. And then once you've got the demand, then you can say, well, what happens if I put um, different heat pumps, um, for example, uh, typically in, in the US and also in Canada, everybody uses air source heat pumps. But as you know, I mean, in, in the Montreal climate, it gets really cold. So you can have very low temperature, but the heat pump is no longer much better than just an electric baseboard heater. Um, various uh, uh, geothermal heat source, of course, is, stays warmer all year round. So once we've got that, we've got the demand, then we can um, compare heat pump scenarios for individual buildings or what if you say, well, let's put all these buildings in the neighborhood together onto one central system with one geothermal heat exchanger. Actually, you can size your system much smaller because the buildings will never have the same peak at the same time. So you actually save cost and actually the central solution um, is actually the best one in terms of um, levelized cost of energy. So these are the kind of things you can do. And I want to give you a few examples um, from the mobility sector as well, because everything I mentioned so far was related to the, the building, the built environment. But we use the same digital twin of a city also to, to run these agent-based um, traffic models. And for example, we look at um, the impact of changing um, the public transit infrastructure, especially the buses from the current diesel buses to, to hybrid or electric, fully electric buses. And many cities, including Montreal, have pledged to, to buy only electric buses in 2025. But uh, funnily enough, uh, they just sort of ordered nearly 1,000 buses <laughs> between now and 2024 to because of course the, the hybrid ones are significantly cheaper than the the fully electric buses and the charging infrastructure is also expensive so but it will happen i mean we we will really expect um, the private cars but also the buses to electrify so the question is given that these um, the buses themselves but also the charging infrastructure is expensive how can we actually use our digital twins to, to optimize the infrastructure? So basically, how can we schedule the buses that now need much more time to charge um, to, to minimize basically the number of buses we need? And where do we actually put um, the charging infrastructure? Because of course, you could put them all in the depots where the buses go overnight, um, but if, during the day, I mean, if the charge um, doesn't last um, for the entire day, you need then to return the buses to the depot and charge again. So you increase basically the so-called deadhead trips. And we build basically models to to find out here in the network of Montreal, um, where would you actually put, put your charging infrastructure and how would you optimize the schedules to reduce these uh, deadhead trips between either the end of a bus line and the depot, or if one bus goes from one route to the others from to, to basically shift from um, one route to the beginning of a next route. You can charge these buses also very fast um, in like 10 minutes or so, but but then the travel range is short. So um, that's, that's basically the challenge. So basically what you get out of these kind of optimization models is the optimum um, schedule for each line. So it's a 
pretty large optimization um, problems. Uh, problems, so we did it here for for 58 bus routes, and um, by optimizing the schedule, um, we could basically save the one the equivalent of of one bus, the purchase of one um, bus, so 1.2 million in in that case, and of course also we had some operational cost saving because um, the deadhead trips were significantly reduced over the year, and that saves cost. So, um, and then finally, we did this uh, fast charging infrastructure location um, planning. And um, again, that's that's an optimization problem of where bus routes maybe cross, um, where you could put in fast charging stations and where you would rely on, on depot charging. So that's a sort of typical um, traffic or mobility sector um, modeling tool. Okay been going pretty fast so we can have some uh, time for discussion all right so what what are the future plans for for these kind of tools um we basically in in the long run um as i said we we don't just want to build digital tools we want to have these tools used in in um, implementation projects and we just won a large grant on electrifying society so on basically for the next seven years, we're going to work on um, on some already existing projects that have basically a fully electrified infrastructure. So we, we call them core projects. One here in, in uh, London, Ontario, this basically zero emission uh, buildings, um, lots of photovoltaics, battery storage, electric vehicle charging, and so on. And um, but just now, I mean, you you really find only, I mean, I would say a handful of projects in in Canada and in the U.S. It, it doesn't look that much better. I mean, real local projects with renewables and storage. So we really want to over the the next seven years, and then we are in 2030, where we have already these 50 percent carbon reductions. We really need to scale up. So we want to to basically use these digital tools to build a kind of sort of platform ecosystem where we sort of inform the demand side. So we, we create these sort of roadmaps for decarbonization using our modeling tools. And that can then help decision making and, and support the implementation um, process. And then on the supply side, we have all the companies um, sitting that that need this information that then can supply technical solutions um, based on the science um, that we've built and, and offer services or offer um, implementation um, projects. And of course, we can also use the tools to, to study decision making. So we're just now building a digital uh, bit environment model for all of Quebec to then allow the environment minister to make policy decisions on on building retrofit or building code basically um, improvements so i think that's that's a bit the idea to to build this kind of um, this ecosystem of of tools that can be used for for real projects and we do want to take the the gaming to a, to a next level I and mean, we've just basically started to build these first prototypes of um, using games to play around with your urban environment. So there's, of course, lots lots of applications, um, more serious ones like the, the building retrofit tools, but also educational tools. And then, of course, there's more fun tools um, that and, and kids tools. So we've done a, done some experiments at, at schools and, and involving kids to to basically walk and do some interaction in, in their neighborhood and let them um, give feedback of what they like and what they don't like. And of course, this whole thing is not restricted to it to the um, computer screen. Um, we can, of course, get much more immersive with the 3D tools so to, to give basically better um, experiences of, of an urban neighborhood. So and then analyze where do people actually what, what catches people's attention. Um, so you can analyze that using some some eye tracking. Um, we of course want to to do these sort of 
not just hybrid or not not just sort of uh, purely virtual events. We need. To, I think we we still believe in having sort of real public event to to make people for start download the games and and um, play with them, and and also interact on a even on a two D screen to to jointly play around the scenarios and discuss how where where basically the the main focus of a of a user group is whether they really care about building height or maybe they care more about composting or so so on. So I think there's still this event of interaction, not just in the virtual space, so in, in this sort of more hybrid space to to really um, encourage participation in in these planning processes. We have been experimenting a bit with um, AI integration, especially in, in City Player, to um, to have basically have these um, modeling tools and then provide an interface to to allow chatbot conversations about your neighborhood. So he basically the model talks back to you and maybe tries to nudge people into um, trying out things that they haven't thought about or modified themselves. So especially around transport choices. So people don't automatically always um, choose um, car sharing or bike usage. So by by somebody talking back to you and maybe suggesting um, behavioral change is another idea of, of um, engaging the, the, the players more in with their neighborhood and to challenge a bit their sort of preconceptions of what they would typically do in in such a such an interactive game all right so that i'm coming already pretty close to what i have to present and maybe we can use some time then to to discuss so so basically what we're trying to do here um, at concordia we we're trying to build sort of science and engineering models in in these domains that have a major impact on on carbon emissions so it's it's of course the buildings um in the transportation system as the, the two main um domains i would say um that are responsible for um carbon emissions renewables we want to bring in renewables um of course because they they clean up the electricity grid but they also provide some more resilience to to cities but that's just the technical side and i think we all know by now that um, although we have the technical solutions we don't really move fast enough because in daily life um, people are not so concerned about um, the um, technical issues they are more interested in sustainability um, I have some students sitting here being really loud. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, anyway, so people are interested in in sustainability dimensions and especially livability, and that's much of much often um, goes into a different direction. So it's more about access to green space, um, air pollution, and and so on, healthy food choices, and so on. So basically, we try to cover these different domains, and then develop a a set of interfaces that allow different kinds of um, stakeholders to interact with the, the urban data. So, um, and, and basically connect them, connect different stakeholders to the different um, tools that we've been building. So the, the citizens, of course, to, to nudge them into um, personal choices on, on their own behavior, the transport authorities to to move towards more public and and active um, transit solutions to um, help this planning electric charging infrastructure and then the municipalities who are mostly interested in in sort of policy um, governance questions but of course they also they retrofit their their own municipal stock so they are very often have questions about building retrofit as well and and then we've got private and um, individual and building owners um, who we can support with um, retrofit solutions for for their buildings and maybe your team i mean the whole google alphabet team of course their their own assets every big company has own assets where you can try out cool sustainable decarbonized um, strategies but we can also talk about the the data 
handling and how we can advance there. And of course, then we want to apply it in case studies in different cities. So in, um, of course, we've been working mainly now in Montreal, but um, I've got close collaborations in New York. We tried to set up a microgrid project in Harlem just now. This London, Ontario project is one of the most ambitious um, projects in Canada for a net zero neighborhood. And we, we do some um, positive energy districts in Amsterdam and Barcelona just now. So that's a bit the ecosystem. So coming to an end, I mean, where I see potential fields for interaction or collaboration is, of course, around the data sharing. I mean, these um, data models, and I've talked a lot about physical modeling just now, but of course, there's a whole world of um, data driven models around occupancy, about transport usage, where um, if we would have better data, we would, of course, use them because the physical modeling is, is takes time, is computationally intensive. It would be great to have more data to first that to, to calibrate the building models, to calibrate the traffic flow models, um, but also to, um, to come up with surrogate models to speed up the whole process of calculation. And, but I think the future is still um, the combination of data-driven and physical models because I think the problem with data-driven models is we want to come up with pretty disruptive scenarios. I mean, we need to move from this super high carbon emission intensity to, to a fraction of it. So I don't think you'll see that in the data yet. So I think the physical models have really a place of saying, if I want to go take a building from today to a 2030 or 2050 scenario, I, I need to model it. Otherwise, I won't have the the information. So, because that's that's basically our goal to to develop these sort of zero emission um, livable urban futures and um, use whatever tools we we have just now available. And it would be great to collaborate on on tools and services, data services, and as I said, working on the own campus. We do that on our own campus. Google for sure has also campuses and buildings um, for case studies. I think that would be another field which would be nice to collaborate. And I think that concludes my collaboration. I stop sharing because otherwise I can't see who's talking. Okay. I... Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I guess let me let me ask you from maybe the biggest perspective. So the, the you have models of individual cities, but looking at it broadly, this is seems like a, a micro version of integrated assessment modeling where you have a model of the climate model the global economy and how the various decarbonization pathways now yeah. the gap between those things which are global and very coarse and what you're doing which is down to the building is it, pretty vast but most work needs to be done in cities so what's the role of, of your you know family of models in this bigger picture of modeling i mean in the end, I would say all these sort of municipal, all these action plans, I mean, that, that countries pledge one to start with a global level. I mean, they, they set targets for sectors, like the building sector, for example, or the, the energy systems or whatever it is, or the transportation system. So we have these targets, but there's a sort of huge gap between these targets, whether they're on the national or provincial level, or even on a municipal level, there most cities have a have a municipal climate plan by now. But I mean, can you really say um, saying, okay, I want to reduce my my building sector emissions by fifty percent by two thousand thirty? That's typical target. But you need to break it down in the end. You need to touch every individual building, and then you need a retrofit strategy. And it just there's a huge gap between these sort of targets. And that's why nothing is, I mean, that's not the only reason. Finance is a big reason, but one of the reasons nothing is happening because um, nobody breaks down these sort of ambitious targets onto, onto concrete action on every building, every bus, every private car, every industrial building and so on. You would need to pay uh, an, an energy consultant to do that. And I've seen it here, um, especially if you talk, I mean, even, even for your private home, you need to have an energy advisor come to your home and, and do an assessment and propose a retrofit strategy. If you're, if you're lucky, that gets paid by some 
government program. So the energy, but somebody needs to pay these persons. If you go to a um, non-residential building, of course, you can't just do it with a rule of thumb. You need you need tools, and then it costs you money. So this initial stage of saying we need a, a retrofit analysis for a building um, costs significant amounts of money. So I think the our ambition is to say that if we, if we speed up this process, if you basically make it available to get a, at least the first um, scenario of what a retrofit could do and how much it would cost, then maybe it would motivate people to say, okay, let's go for it. You would still then at some point you need to employ an engineering company to, to do the mm -hmm. executive planning, but at least you have a sort of first feasibility for free mm -hmm. or for very low cost for free, basically just now um, to to say, well, is it worth my while? And, and to think, to start thinking about it. And that's just not existing today. Okay, so we're pushing in that direction. If I am, um... You know, uh, uh, we're, we're private developers now, and we want to build. I'll give you a scenario of um, like mass timber, like, like Quebec is a good example of mass timber surrounded by forests. Yeah. Um, what I mean, I would need to know what's actually profitable. Where do I put which forest do I use? Which where do I build the sawmills? Which sites are plausible for mass timber building because there are constraints. You cannot be more than 18 stories right now, and so on. So that's a concrete use case. But I want to know how do I make a profit? from this net, well, uh, net negative strategy. I mean, okay, now you opened even more buckets. Now you said, I want to do the full su supply chain from from uh, yeah. forest to to end of life. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think anybody has all the models in one sort of reasonably harmonized platform yet. I mean, as I said, when we started, even building models and transport models are two different domains usually because there's such a different competence i mean i was always in buildings i saw i had real trouble to get into transportation modeling because i had basically no clue four years ago i i, I don't claim that i have much of a clue but you you have very few people who, who even try to tackle these different dom domains um, and, and try to build software around it. So, I mean, of course, we, we do life cycle assessment for building materials, for example, um, but usually we don't, I mean, we've done a bit of analysis of um, for end of life of, because there we know where the landfills are in our in our region and say, does it make a difference? Um, what, what happens to the construction waste if we recycle it or how much carbon emissions are caused if you if you bring it to a landfill, it calcul calculated really the, the the transportation emissions as well. So yeah, you can do it all if you know where your materials come from. You can of course do the calculations of transport transport related emissions and of course also material right. related emissions. It needs again a lot of data. So and often the data is not easily accessible. It's still, to a large extent, a question of, of data accessibility. I think the methods are around. Every, I mean, it's, it's known how to do a life cycle mm -hmm. carbon assessment and also life cycle costing, but you need you need to have good data. And mm -hmm. I think we're, we're slowly we're slowly moving in this direction. There's a lot of talk about this sort of urban mining, which is not urban data mining, but really materials because we, we're running short of resources. Yep. So to have, to have a sort of in these 3D models, you can of course build a, a kind of inventory of which material is available. And if you ever deconstruct, then you know, okay, I've got so and so many tons of aluminium that I could maybe recycle, or I have windows that can go to another building project and so on. If if you know the status of, of these materials and yeah. But I, I think we're still a far way. Uh, we, we're just at the beginning, I would say, of this kind of sort of really detailed, disaggregated um, analysis. And in terms of like, there's many models that are at disposal. So you mentioned Energy Plus, and I'm also connecting this to the work by Department of Energy in US, where we develop some of these component models, but also do similar analysis like Comstock, Reststock, which is a rough approximation of what m most buildings are. So I guess what are the raw resources that you have? I mean, these models as well as others, like Transims, I'm thinking from Argonne, 
are, the, are these components that you you are federating or are you maybe adding some base components to the mix? I mean, I don't, we, I don't think we need that many more models. I mean, the, the building models, for example, are, are definitely around. I mean, there's still some issues of uh, some details, I would say, where they're maybe not flexible enough and we would like to modify um, parameters that we cannot modify or the way they deal with the, the, the shading, for example, is, is very cumbersome and, and slow. So we would like to, if you would have access, if we could assign the, the irradiance to every surface of a window in Energy Plus, would be really nice because we mm. have a much faster shading algorithm that we can run once for the entire city and then just use a lookup table. It would speed up calculation considerably. So it, it's not perfect. I mean, these tools still have room for improvement, but in, in general, I think the main challenge are not really so much the models. I mean, there's, there's good agent-based models. Right. It's more finding the data to parameterize these models because at the beginning here we, we used basically data from the US because mm -hmm. the NREL did a good job of, of cataloging yeah. um, these building archetypes and whereas in Canada the the Natural Resources Canada they basically started just to build these archetypes for the new building codes so you basically have quite good archetypes for I would say since maybe 1990 or so but everything constructed earlier is one category of, of mm -hmm. because they never worked on it and so that's of course a problem because you're building from 1980s of course pretty different from 1930 or so but just just due to the history of how these catalogs these archetypes were developed often you just don't have the data available okay and, and now, to what extent are uh private data sets useful i mean or purchasable even i'm thinking like <clears throat> adam um well, who are the other ones um that uh oh losing the name of these things or the data sets of, of uh, change of address forms they're going back 30 40 years of where everybody has moved but you you pay for them um so how much of this is a data purchasing problem as opposed to availability problem no good question i mean i'm not i mean there's some i mean in, in the building sector uh, i don't i'm not really aware of so many purchasable useful data sets because i mean the, the most useful ones would be around building permitting because that usually has information on on whether a building has been retrofitted or the usage has been changed so cities do have this data mostly it's, it's not digitalized or and and of course it's never been standardized so it's mainly a text form description I, it knows so you need, yeah you need you to do yeah. yeah 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 you yes um i think what what seems to be i, I guess where we could get much more purchasable data is probably more in the transportation domain so that is a domain i i know less about but i mean we've of course looked in in available um traffic flow um data i mean i guess google has a, has a lot of data but we, we can't make use of it i mean it's i mean not on a not on a sort of uh large in in, in large scale of course it, it would be nice to have some real traffic flow information for sure to to validate all these agent-based models. I mean, I guess, so the outdoor data, like um, lots of, sort of smart street lights or so, measure a lot of outdoor data and they can be purchased. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mainly traffic flow information, air pollution, uh, temperature data, so heat island things, but I'm not aware that, um, that there are some really good data sets that tell you more of the internal use of the building because there's just the ownership is so diverse um it's it's really hard of course there's companies who manage large amount of assets and yeah and then you if you talk to them they they can of course give you access to all the, the building management data which is a super useful resource but 
these data sets we, we did buy data sets of course i mean the, the ones especially the valuable are the ones where you have all the information on the status of a, of a building and the energy information the smart metering in a high time resolution there are some really good data sets and we need to pay for it and we do that of course because there's lots of research on, on uh, developing data driven models for for load prediction load disaggregation and right. and all of this but you, but again it's it's never for an entire city it's, it's just because there has been a project somewhere where they installed yeah. tons of meters then and then you can buy this data set nice but i mean i've never heard of here that you can get the data for the city of los angeles or so pay 10000 and you get it i i don't think that exists i mean but then maybe flipping yeah. around if i'm a company and i you know i'm Disney, that's a nice diverse company with many different installations. And I deploy sensors everywhere to understand how I can do this in my locations. I guess then the question becomes um, one data model, but then what data, what, what's the opportunity for small, cheap, ubiquitous sensors that like a single actor can use? I mean, of course, it depends on the question you try to answer. But if you stay with this sort of carbon emission sure, yeah. conversation question, I think, I mean, in the end, you, you basically need smart metering data and, okay. and reasonably disaggregated. I mean, it would be good to have more than just one point, one data point mm -hmm. per huge building. That's what we have here. We have big, huge institutional buildings, one single data point. And then you get sort of megawatt consumption and you have basically no idea where that comes from. Um, so a bit of sub metering, um, smart metering information is the most Im important, of course. And what we do, I mean, then you can, most leads are available. That's that's one thing. Then, then you can try to find proxies and, and mostly it's around usage. And that's probably the cheapest kind of information that is available. Um, uh, around occupancy of the buildings, because there you can start analyzing Wi-Fi signals or mm. um, mobile phone use or so. So you, you do get, I, I would expect that in the future we will get much better data around real occupancy. And and then even if you just have super aggregated energy metering, you can already say, but if my building is basically not occupied or everybody has left the library, why do I still have a high electricity consumption yeah of my hvac system so then you find these sort of the low-hanging fruits of what what is going wrong in in the buildings it's it's often related to occupancy and i think that that is reasonably easy to to get access to okay cool and then let me just ask kind of well, zooming back out um it seems like a lot of these analyses are useful for co-design of uh, using building slash uh transport uh, energy demand slash energy power grid co-design yes. um but to do that you need to have integration with many different kinds of models and the mobility you've integrated but power grid yes. and well we just talked yes. about wood supply chain that's a lot more work yeah well i mean that's basically my team is trying to cover all that i mean we have electrical engineers who do the power flow modeling um we have transportation people who do the traffic modeling the buildings the main consumers and some guys who look at industry um, consumption and if you put that together and say okay everything electric we know the distribution network we can find out are there capacity limits where can charging stations go i mean of course we it, it's not a it's a university team we are maybe 50 people but still we we try to cover all these domains and try to bring all these models open source models from these different communities together and of course, if you would have more people, then we could do we could move faster. So I, I think it's it's building now this sort of commu open source community, or get companies who try to make business models out of it. That's really not in not the main um, topic. But I think the the strategies are already there, and everything is geolocalized. So we have we know where where all these assets are, whether they're buildings or or car objects or people moving or so so and where the power grid is of course and and then you you basically bring together these demands and and supplies okay that, that, no that makes a lot of sense 
and flipping it around, <clears throat> we talked about how to design uh, infrastructure. So uh, what about monitoring it? Saying that we were this successful at reducing emissions because you know, mm -hmm. to, uh, farm example, you got, you know, some farmer changes the way they farm, but they have a giant manure pile to the side with that emits methane. Because many of these things where you did the thing you, you claim to do, but there's a bunch of other stuff that completely negates what you've done. So you have to monitor the outcomes. So to yes. what extent is this useful for monitoring? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely essential. I mean, I, I think, again, there's no single method of monitoring um, emissions. I mean, on, on the buildings, it's, it's pretty simple because you just monitor, continue monitoring your, your energy consumption and you know whether you've improved or not. And on traffic, is a bit more complicated because it's not all happening inside the city. Yeah. It's not attributed to a single vehicle. But yeah, but you can still get again if you can get the data of what is what is consumed, how the charging stations are used, how the petrol consumption is. You you can you can assess whether you made progress on it, it's as I said. The, as soon as you leave the boundaries of the city, I mean, this whole scope three That's emissions is, is more complicated. The, the, where you attribute it um, to the inhabitants. But I think this lifestyle carbon emission accounting does exactly this. It tries really to attribute it to a person who lives in a city because I think that's only fair because if you live in a rich city, you're going to consume more. So it's, and it doesn't matter whether the product is produced in China. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be production based. It should be based on the person who consumes it. And so I think that, that to me makes total sense. And we, if, if, if we, if you try to get the data per capita in, in a given location, I think that gives a fair picture of, of where we stand and, and whether we made progress. Okay, uh, that, that's uh, really interesting. Um, and uh, we're at time, but I do want to ask one more question because most population growth is not happening in North America or Europe. It's, it's uh, Africa, India, China. And especially, I think probably Africa and India are probably the most uh, under-monitored, especially, I guess, Africa, because you have so many different regulatory clim uh, uh, climates, especially India, so many states. Uh, I guess, what's even possible there where most of the population is happening, you know, population growth? I mean, the, the the data I showed you for the cities, that, that's actually a student, graduate student who came from India. And and of course, they didn't have a, a nice 3D model, but they worked on doing uh, drone-based um, flying. Yeah. And, and they, they built a complete uh, 3D model of Hyderabad. So it's, uh, I think the, the, the technologies, I mean, it has become pretty cheap to, to get these kind of basic models. So I... Well, it's it's more you need people who have an interest to to set them up and and do it. But um, I think that's it's not a this sort of basic information that I showed you that we need to to build the models, and that's why models are good because you need less data. Right. <laughs> the more yeah. you need, the less data you need. If if you wait for the data to arrive, you're right. I mean, it will take a long time to to get these data sets. But if you use models, I think, and, and do a bit of calibration that you're not completely out of whack, then I think you're good. All right, no, that, that's, you know, <laughs> I said it's a way forward. And, and I guess hopefully if you have a model of a city, you, you kind of motivate them to provide you with better data because you have well, they get a, a stake from getting it, from, from giving you the data and getting yes. a better picture. Um, yeah. Okay, well, it's fascinating. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for having me, and let's see what we make out of it. Absolutely. And so, uh, let me stop recording, and let me just do the live stream. Yeah. And practically speaking, uh, I mean, so the, the point of inviting you was to see if there's any collaboration. So we'll see what the audience says. 